You haven't guessed? This is the Birdsville Races 2014 edition. Last time you saw me though, and Dave, we were in the dead geo centre of the Simpson Desert. Now, I'm hoping that we both get a bit lucky here with a race, maybe back a winner. I wasn't quite so lucky on this recent trip. To find out exactly what I'm talking about, stay tuned, because this was a trip I don't think I'll ever forget. I'll give you a hint, neither will my truck. Mate, your shout. Let's go get a beer. Lead on. Looking for a mad deal on the gear that you're chasing? Like this awning, I've got you covered. Keep an eye out throughout this video for an exclusive discount code and get 10% off store-wide for all Full Drive Supercenter YouTube subscribers. And as always, enjoy this adventure because this is an epic trip. Yep, in episode 227, the boys from Hema, Dave and I, took on an adventure of a lifetime. And by going across country following historic shot lines, we'd made it to the geo centre of the Simpson Desert. Now all we had to do was get back out of there. Excellent. And it all started with a plan. Lads, I don't want to alarm anyone, but uh, we are currently in the middle of the Simpson Desert, and the only way out of the middle of the Simpson Desert is to drive out, as you all know. Well, what's the plan? You reckon we retrace our footsteps back out to this shot line and then try and pick up some shot lines all the way back, Rob? You reckon that's the best way out to the Hay River track? The plan was pretty much to mirror our route in, but continue east on shot lines until reaching the Hay River track, heading south and then follow the QAA all the way to Birdsville. Well, we all know that the end goal is Birdsville, of course, for the Birdsville races. I'm dead keen, never been before, and it's an absolute must for me, but yep. how are you going for fuel? Yeah, I reckon I'm... I reckon I'm on the money, yeah. and I'm, I'm going according to plan, so You're right. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm a little touch and go, I don't know, I just, it's been a bit heavier going carrying all the camera gear and, and everything else in this thing, it's been a little bit heavier going than I thought it was, but that's why you've got spare, yep. that's why you've got spare, we can help each other out. Between us we'll be fine, yeah, absolutely. Alright, well let's, uh, let's wrap this up and leave the big pole to stand there for a bit longer. Yeah, that's it. And uh, make a move, what do you reckon? Alright, done. Let's do it. Let's go. I wonder if I'll ever get back to the centre of the Simpson Desert. Yeah, I don't know. It might be one of those one, once in a lifetime kind of places. So. First up, we had to retrace our tyre tracks back to a southern shot line that we'd actually come up from the main junction. We were heading east once more, and even though we were tackling dunes on the shallow face, some were still proving difficult to cross and had steep drop offs on the other side. Oh, I wasn't sure which way to go, whether to try um, Rob's line with your line. We're in the middle. In the middle, I think. That looked the that's best where at you the went time, yeah. The yep. yeah. When you come over that edge there, I thought that is a bold move. <laughs> but you came down it straight and that's the key. Yeah, yeah that's straight it. Yeah. Yeah. We'd reached the southern shot line, so we needed to push further south for approximately 50 kilometres and then look out for another shot line that would take us east toward the Hay River track. However, before we found our junction, we found something else. Back in the 70s and 80s when these shot lines were being put through for seismographic surveys, there was a heck of a lot of work being done in the middle of the Simpson Desert. So really, it's not surprising that we would stumble across some evidence of the workers being out here. Maybe this is an old surveyor's camp. There's no doubt it's not moving. <laughs> KM 1971. Well, I've got no idea what all this is. Bit of a mystery. Whatever it is, is very heavy duty as you can see down here. It's not that old, back in the 70s. If you look down on this little inscription down here, someone has got their pocket knife out and put their initials in the date. It's funny, you know, at what point does graffiti start to become artifacts or art, or something useful to society? That's graffiti. Someone probably got into trouble for writing their initials on there and Dad probably said, what the heck did you do that for? I'm a new car. But now, 40 years later, it's actually quite useful. I don't know what it is, 
not marked on any map. It's not a campsite that we know of. We've just sort of bumped into it out here in the middle of nowhere. I guess it's rubbish at the end of the day. <laughs> but it's interesting rubbish. I suppose it's not too well. Relic from the past. All you gotta do is leave something for 30, 40 odd years and it becomes a landmark. I'd also throw my older Cooper hat out right now. No one to care. 40 years from now, however. No one to care. Once Graham and Rob had finished logging this site, we were back on the hunt for the eastbound shot line. And there it was, not too far from the old surveyor's camp. That eastbound shot line would take us in the direction of the Hay River track, but it was extremely faint and really hard to follow. Yeah, the track's pretty hard to see at times, isn't it? Or whatever, whatever we're calling the track. I'm finding it very easy to follow, mate. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you at least have got some wheel tracks, mate. Yeah, I've got perfect wheel tracks. How are you boys going up there? Doing well? I'm relying heavily on Graham here because um, at times I can't see the track ahead, but he's got it all on the imagery yep. and um, yep. he just says left, right, tells him which way to go. Keeping it remarkably straight, I'm looking at my breadcrumb trail here and, oh, well, I mean, you're not deviating at all as far as I'm concerned. Oh man, look at that one coming up. It's like when you're out surfing, that just looks like a huge set wave coming towards us. At this rate, we didn't know how long it was going to take before we could get our hands on a camel pie at the Birdsville Bakery. Wow, it seemed like an eternity anyway. Don't get run over, mate. No, I try not to. Not now, anyway. Busy here. What are you going to have? Thanks, mate. Good on you. Thank you. You better join the queue, yeah. eh? Yeah, people are curried camel. Yeah. yeah. They're too good. Yeah, no, they are good. Too many curried camels, please. Not the whole camel, just the pies. <laughs> so much choice here, but I think you can't go past when you come to the Birdsville Bakery. Curry camel pie, famous all over Australia. Oh, did you get me one? I got you one, mate. Oh, no doubt about it. I didn't get two for me. All right, shall we sit outside? Can't eat them. Yeah. Sit outside? Yeah, sit outside. Don't put sauce on it, Dusty gets angry. <laughs> yeah. Really good. Mm. Well, a rule of thumb at the Burrsville races is to make sure you've got a recovery plan. You know how it is. Curried pie, curried camel pie, that is, from the Burrsville Bakery, is about as good a recovery plan as you can hope to get. However, when you cross the Simpson Desert, this isn't going to help you one bit. Make sure your recovery gear is always handy because a recovery in the Simpson Desert, almost a sure bet. What would you say? Oh, yeah. These are good. These are a sure bet. At this stage, our journey to Birdsville was turning out to be slower than we'd ever thought. We were only about a third of the way across the shot line to the hay, and I'd found myself some remarkably soft sand. Oh, stroke. Everything's more difficult in the sand. <laughs> Another sand dune. As you can see, another bogging. Good thing about this one though is we've got some company down there. There's, there's four emus down there. If you're watching this at home and thinking I look like I'm knackered, it's because I am. Sand, it's hard work. Rob had already made his descent down the steep side of the dune, so it made a lot of sense for him just to stay where he was and for Dave and I to work this one out. Tell you what, Dave, sand is hard work, my friend. You got a copy up there? Yeah, mate. Yeah, I've got a copy. Yeah, there you go, and you all connect it up. Mate, we're all ready to rock and roll. I think we'll just take it gently, gently, and just see how we go. I'm, I'm, I'm not that stuck. I just need a bit of a pop over the top of this lip, mate. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just first slow. Just watch out on your clutch. That's all. Yeah, mate. I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna go when you go. Roger that. You ready? I am ready. All right. Yeah. Beautiful mate, beautiful. Easy as that. While the Hema boys were on the other side of the dune waiting for us, they'd actually found more evidence of those that had been here before us. Hey mate, look what I found for you. <laughs> Unbelievable, eh? Middle of nowhere, an old shovel. <laughs> Have a look at this, will you? I'm in one of the most remote places I've been to anywhere in Australia, heck, anywhere in the world for that matter, and we're on a, uh, we're on a track that doesn't get driven at all regularly. Heck, I was starting to doubt if that track had ever been driven ever. We come across this, an old shovel. So I guess it does mean this track has been driven at some stage. It's a, uh, it's a reasonably old shovel. It could have come from one of the blokes on the shot line, original guys coming through here, or maybe just someone as adventurous as us in the last 40 odd years. And I think this is gonna come home with me and sit in the man cave. Or maybe dig me out of a sand dune later on, I'm not too sure which. We'd been driving all day and we'd hardly scratched the surface. The last thing we wanted was another recovery situation before camp that night. It's 
great how the colours change late in the afternoon. This is, uh, well, middle of the day. It's not even red at all, really, but now it's a bright red sand dune, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty sweet. This one's got a big drop off to the east, so just going to head along it a bit and then I'll see if we can find an easier spot. Just gorgeous time of day though. Yeah, early morning and late afternoon in the desert. Beautiful, can't beat it. Uh oh. <laughs> you stop there, mate. Take it a bit quicker than I did. How'd you go, Graham? Did you get through? Yeah, mate, the big turbo whistle kicked in and away we went. Well, yours, Dave, how'd you go? Yeah, no, I learned from games and stakes, they made it easy. <laughs> well, soft up on top there, though. Wow, look at this big open expanse here. I mean, this, this is one of the biggest distances between the dunes we've seen, and this dune would have to be one of the biggest ones we've driven down. It's hard to comprehend just how slow driving out here can be. Back home, you do your homework, you try and figure out just what distances you're going to cover in a day, but then the reality of weaving through vegetation over sand drifts, trying to pick your line over sand dunes, means that you're often going a heck of a lot slower than you ever could have thought. With the sun getting low and a flat area of land presenting itself, we took the opportunity to set up camp. some absolute doozies of campsites in the Simon. I think for me that's what makes the Simpson Desert so darn special really it's the camping because the campsites are well they're champagne they're five star. Some of my favourites of course have been the ones we didn't mean to camp at. What do I mean by that? Well up on top of sand dunes and we couldn't find anywhere else because of course you get that beautiful view. There's nothing like waking up on a sand dune in the morning to the sun coming up and an absolutely cracking view out of your swag. Other sites that come to mind for me up along that Hay River track with all those breakaways, really pretty stuff. Camping in the Simpson Desert? Well, I'll tell you what, I've said it many, many times. It's as good as it gets. It was a good idea to get some rest and get into the swags early because we were going to need the energy for the big push towards Birdsville in time for the big race weekend. You want a mojo? No, I don't feel like a mojo. We might have a look in this one here. Mm. It's a good time to be here, middle of the day. Everyone's out of the races. Mm. Whips and riding cops. Don't you start. <laughs> there you are, fellas. These whips are nice. You got a whip? Yeah, I have, but. but... Because I can't crack it properly. You've stuffed your cracker. <laughs> <laughs> crackers kaput. You can crackers kaput. Here's some whips down here, mate. Yeah? Mate, do you mind if I have a, pardon the pun, have a crack at one of your whips? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Go on here, you can try. Now you've got public indemnity, right, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, but I reckon you're not worth 10 million. But... 10 million? No. <laughs> Stand back. Hold my drink. Right, so I better step out, like out of the open, I'm not that good. Crikey. I'm going to put my safety glasses on. It's good to go pear shaped. I'm going to go right out here. This might be the safest spot for me. Oh, he's doing it. Ah! Ah! Hang <laughs> on. Oh, hang on, there's people coming. <laughs> just round them up. Yeah. Well, that is a cracking whip. Makes a cracking sound, and I love having a crack at it. However, there's a crack of a different sort about to make an appearance. You're going to find out exactly what that is in the next part of our Simpson Desert Adventure. For us, though, the Birdsville races are starting to heat up. I think we might continue walking around, mate. Thank you so much for letting me have a go at that. No worries. I'll give that back to you before I take my ear and my eye out. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Cheers, mate. Okay. See you. See you later. Thanks, buddy. Get more for less at Four Wheel Drive Supercenter with incredible deals on Adventure King's camping and outdoor gear. Take your camping experience to the next level with the amazing Grand Tourer Mark III aluminium rooftop tent. The rooftop tent that practically sets itself up. King's portable gazebos are built ultra strong with a tough steel frame, are easy to set up even by yourself and are available in multiple sizes for the campsite or the job site. The incredible new 270 degree freestanding awning can be set up in just 40 seconds and wraps around the side and the back of your car for incredible amounts of shelter. Hit the water on a King's inflatable stand up paddleboard for an insane amount of fun at the beach, the river or the dam, but warning it's highly addictive. Plus there's fridges, solar panels and more to make every adventure incredible. 
At Full Drive Supercenter, you get more for less. So you come over here. Hey. Oh, yeah, there they are. Yeah. Oh, there's Breno. Breno! The people you meet. How are you? Can I have a chair, man? Wow, look at this. You know we're near the finishing line, you know that. Have a look at this. It goes to show they'll let just about anyone into the Bearsville races. Breno, mate, what are you doing here? Man, we uh, we figured we'd come through here on the way out. I grabbed a couple of readers. We came out from Sydney. Yep. We're uh, going to go out through the Simo. Yep. Then go across to Fraser Island. <laughs> so, from the centre to the beach? Basically, yeah. You've Birdie got... to the beach. Birdie to the beach, mate. What a cracking tip. Yeah, you've got to fit it in. Mate, when did they last mow this place? Because <laughs> I reckon they need to look at their lawnmower. I reckon they had about 10 o'clock this morning, I think. <laughs> I reckon they need to adjust the blade height. They're going way too low. <laughs> Folks, I am super comfortable sitting down here. I'm in the shade. Got cold water. I might even go and get a cheeky beer in a minute. Which is in direct and stark contrast to when we started to make our way out towards the Hay River track. It was so rough. Throw in a couple of recoveries, plus the heat of the day. And I tell you what, you couldn't have been further from the Birdsville races. Mate, it might be your buy for a beer. Let's do it. <laughs> Still only a third of the way along the eastbound shot line of the hay, we were up and away from camp early and getting stuck into it. Good job. Woohoo! It's a heck of a drop off on this side, I'll tell you what. There we go. Wow, that was a decent June, that one. Ah, yes! And we are now 22.5 kilometres from tonight's camp. We'd made some good ground, but then I realised the GU had an electrical issue. It's kind of funny what's happened here. Yesterday I said to Dave, have you ever encountered a problem where your sub-tank on a GU patrol won't kick in because of the problem with batteries, and Dave's seen that problem before. The solution to that problem is to disconnect all your batteries, leave it 15 minutes and everything resets and you can use your sub-tank again. So let's forget that for a second. Driving along this morning and I noticed I wasn't getting full charge to my two dual batteries. So I've checked the, I've checked the fuse, everything seems to be okay. We've done a bit of a test here, everything seems to be okay. What's actually happened is the camera crew last night charging all their gear have run my batteries down so flat that I'm unable to use my battery, my dual battery charging system just yet. We need to bring that charge back up. So we know what's going on, that's not a problem. We'll keep driving and everything will fix itself. The plus side to this though, Dave, they ran my batteries so flat last night They've actually fixed my sub-tank problem. <laughs> so my sub-tank's now working. So I guess I can't be angry with them. They've kind of fixed the problem I had with the sub-tank. Now I've just got to wait for my batteries to charge back up again so that they can charge their gear. So that's what's gone wrong, mate. Yeah, but I think we'll, we'll monitor it again in a yeah. little while and see how we go. Let's give it a good solid hour or two of driving yep. and we'll have a look at yep. it. But um, there's a silver lining to that cloud. Yeah, well, yes. The sub-tank's working again. <laughs> Thanks, camera crew. <laughs> Rob and Graham were utterly thorough with their objectives throughout our entire journey and logged every marker we passed including this picket that they spotted while Dave and I were under the bonnet of the GU. It was attention to detail like this that really made me realise why HEMA maps and navigators and the apps that they put out are so darn accurate. So what did you say the bearing was? 60 degrees? 60 degrees. Coming around now. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yep. Yep. We'd been gaining ground and getting back on schedule, but once again, the heavy GU had found some soft sand. Dave? Yeah, I've come unstuck down here, mate. Have you done that? It doesn't look that bad. Just this lip, mate. She's really soft at the top. I'm, I'm a metre from the top, mate. Jump out and grab these max tracks, I think. You may be wondering why I didn't just reverse, but I was actually caught up on the lip and it bellied out. Tie rope still? Yeah, I'll try my straps to them because I think we'll, we might have trouble finding these things. <laughs> now, what I'm doing here, these ribbons that you can see, or these fluoro bits of cordage right here, the idea behind them is that you stick them on your max tracks, and as you're about to see, I think, when I take off, the max tracks, if they're doing their job, should actually get buried in the sand quite heavily. And these things actually hang out the top of the sand. If you've ever used max tracks in sand, you'll know that you can lose them. You can, yep. They go under really deep, and you've yep. got to dig around to find them. But these, all four of them, should stick up outside the sand. All I've got to do is follow these down and pull the max tracks out. They're actually a really good idea. The idea behind what I'm doing right now is just so I can get a better angle on these max tracks, because as you can see, 
there's not much room underneath the chassis here, so I'm just making sure I can get the Max Tracks down close to the tyre so it bites in. I'll just lay it on the sand, it'll probably just sit there spinning and miss the Max Track. You want to get the Max Tracks as close to under the tyre as you can. Alright, this other side might need a shovel, I think. I'll give you that. That's alright. If you've got to do this sort of recovery out in the middle of the desert, remember just take it slow and steady. Dehydration and heat exhaustion out here yeah. is a very real possibility. Okay. So the real key to this is to try and idle it. It feels kind of weird because you, you feel like you should be giving it a lot of throttle and really what you don't want to be doing is about half the throttle you normally give it, which is not really enough to get yourself out, but the Max Tracks do all the work. When you feel it for the first time, it really is quite a remarkable sensation. We'll give it a go. You can feel it, it's, it's, it's like a, it's almost like a, someone, it's almost like someone's snatching you. It's so, it's almost that much of a force forward. It really does pull you up and straight out, as you saw then. But you don't want to get on them and start spinning. That's how you destroy your Max Tracks, because you just knock those little lugs off. So, the key is really just to idle your way out. The Max Tracks grip, pulls you up out of the sand. It's just like that, and off you go. All right, I'm out. I'm going to get those Max Tracks. Dave decided he'd have another crack at the sand dune, but it was just so soft and steep at the top of that lip. He nearly made it too. And looking back on it, I reckon another attempt and maybe a bit more herb, he would have got up over the top, but just made sense to whack him under the tyres and two minutes later, he was on top. Oh, piece of cake. Made him out. All these recoveries, of course, were just costing us valuable time. It was looking more and more like we were going to miss the first day of the races for sure at this point in our journey. What are you thinking, mate? Hey, picking these, I might as well just pick a number. Same, right? same, same. So what are you thinking? Uh, I don't know. Just because it sounds a bit casual, maybe Joe Blow. Joe Blow? Right, yeah. Done. All right, then we're going here to get a better. Yeah, let's go, go find a bookie. Let's do it. Well, I wouldn't have a clue, mate. I reckon horses are sharp at the end and blunt at the middle. I'm going to go for faster buster, mate, number 11. What do you reckon? Yeah, Yeah, he's giving me the... That's a hot tip. Five each way, 11. Done. Done deal. Thanks, mate. As we all know, heading across country and off tracks is tough at the best of times, but what I was about to do, things were going to get a heck of a lot harder for me. Let's hope we'll have a bit more luck here today, and I reckon that one there says it all. I've got this. I could literally spend the rest of the day up here if it weren't for the fact that I feel we are quite behind schedule. Mate, uh, we are. It's true. Significantly? Uh, it's taken a long time. Yeah. You know, when I set this up in the Navigator originally, yep. and also the Hema Explorer app, I thought we'd average around five, maybe eight k's, that sort of speed. And we're averaging about 3.8, 3.9. And we've only travelled around 15 kilometres. How far have we got to go? Mate, we've got about 27. Today. Today. So we've done about a third of a day, and it's now 1.30. <laughs> right, yeah. Don't shake your head. <laughs> we're we're going to have our work cut out for us. Yeah, I think we are. I think yep. we are. Let's, Let's do it, here. mate. Let's get out of here. With the thought of missing the Birdsville races, we pushed hard that afternoon. Well, that top it looks a bit gnarly. Yeah, it's moved around a bit, left and right. Coming around a corner here, and I've got this chopped up bit here. I'm gonna give it a bit, but not too much. Second for this truck really kicks in, and it's it's nice for me to be able to use that when I need to. So I can crawl, but then plant it. Second gear low really does do the job for me. We stayed in the saddle and gave it hell along the remaining shot lines to the Hay River track. Surely, once we reached there, we would be home and hosed. However, having pulled off the track just for five minutes to stretch our legs, I was making a routine and quick vehicle check which led us 
to make a potentially disastrous discovery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bit of metal sticking out. Yeah. That's a chassis cracked. You sure that's a chassis? Or? Yeah. It does appear to be a small crack under there. Yeah. yeah. But we need to keep an eye on that. It's fixable though? Oh yeah, definitely yeah. fixable, absolutely. It's one of those things that just can happen. We've just, we've just noticed we've got a little tiny hairline crack going through the chassis. It's not something anyone wants to hear ever, no matter where you are. No. But uh, here in the middle of the Simo, it's a, um, something of a game changer, really. <laughs> yeah, well that's it. It just means we've got to be extra cautious yeah. from this point on. Yeah, we might have to call in some favours at Barnsley's, mate. Well, yeah, <laughs> we'll go and <laughs> give the old fellow a call. Well, it's a bit of a negative, but um, it's about all we've got at the moment, so I think we'll get all the weight out of this thing and start the slow, slow crawl back into, into Birdsville. First thing we did, of course, was decrease the weight on the GU. I shared the load by letting go of the water that I had in the tank and, of course, taking the two spare wheels off the back and a lot of the stuff that we had on the roof rack. Anything that would decrease the chance of that crack getting worse. Given that the crack was only minor at this stage, I knew I stood a very good chance of driving out and saving myself a heck of a lot of money. We were pretty close to some well-defined shot lines that would take us to the Hay River track and, of course, that would be like a highway in comparison to what we'd been travelling. Well, we're getting close now, boys. I think we're one more shot line away. Well, this one's a little bit more bigger than we expected. We might follow it for a bit and um, see if we can get across to the height. We literally limped the rest of the way along the shot lines until eventually we had made it to one of the Simo's most iconic tracks. Here she comes. We are on the hay. Yeah, we are there. All right. Wow. Woo! Well, I'll tell you what, that certainly feels good. Done it. Wow, I've forgotten what a road looks like. I have to go all the, over all those bumps anymore. Well done, boys. Well done, Cheers, mate. Good, Good idea. Job. Even though we were off the really rough stuff, I was still pretty nervous about that crack under the canopy. It was time to see if I would need to pitch camp right here and wait for a tow. Well, boys, I guess this will be the telling point. Come off that rough stuff and we'll have a look and see if it's moved. If it's moved, then we might be staying here. How's it looking? Mm. Uh, it's worrying. No, nah, no, nah, it's all right. <laughs> it's exactly, exactly where I left it. Oh, good. It's about that long and hasn't moved at all. She'll be fine. We'll get in there and get Dave the wizard on there with his welder. And yep. She'll be stronger than she was when we started. Yeah, dear. Done. Straight. All right, should we move on? Let's do it. All right. Let's go. On we went, heading south down the hay, and wow, did it feel good. With a bit of pressure off, Rob wanted to show us an old oil well. Hey, look at this bloke. He could weld. I need this guy. 25, 47, 30. Yep. And 137, 56. 57, 10. Oh, the minutes, the minutes and seconds are the seconds are a little bit out. He's out by four seconds. Given he was using a camel instead of a GPS, he's probably pretty close. <laughs> it's pretty amazing how accurate some of the surveyors were back then. Mm. Even the popple yeah. corner, when yeah. they measured that. Yeah. Poor guys had to drag chains all the way up there yeah. and measure, measure a whole border yeah. with chains. Yeah. But didn't he get it wrong? Yeah, and only because the chain stretched a little bit over Mate, I know a few all hundred about, kilometres. I know all about metal fatigue. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let him go. That would have been done with arc welder too. Ah, that's what we need, our welder. We need a welder. Let's go. All Come right. on. Let's Let's go 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 find a welder. Go find a welder. Don't get in my car. I don't need the extra weight. <laughs> <laughs> Just a pinch further south, and we were hooking left and across a huge salt pan that brought back some awesome memories. Yeah, that was just going through my mind, the K1 Salt Lake. Mate, I'll tell you what, when we looked across this and you said to me, we've got to go that way, I remember thinking, there is no way we can get across there. That just looks gnarly. And off we went. <laughs> it was insane. Once again, we hadn't quite made it. It was time to set up camp for the night just off the QAA line. This had been an amazing journey up to this point. The days previous spent pushing in to the middle of the Simpson Desert and then the long, hard slog back out. This was a trip that was beginning to define itself as one of the most memorable I'd ever done. You'll notice I was using a ground sheet out there. Of course, the reason for that is Simpson sand, like any sand, gets into just about everything. And when you're camping in one of the world's biggest sand pits, so I reckon anything you can do to stop sand getting into your swag is worth the effort. It really does pay to pick up a bit of firewood before you get to your campsites out here. Obviously, people all try and congregate in the one spot on the Simpson, and although you've got a lot of room out there, firewood in certain areas is very hard to find, but in other areas, it's plentiful. My tip is just pick up bits and pieces as you're driving along during the day. That way, when you get into camp or when you do find a nice campsite, your firewood chores are already done. You really would be surprised at just how cold it gets at night in the middle of winter out in the Simpson Desert. 
By day, you get shorts, thongs and singlets, but at night, you've got to make sure you've got layers and, of course, bring yourself a big heavy jacket to wear. I guarantee you'll use it. Right about now, I was feeling pretty content, but I reckon I'd feel a whole heap better if I knew I could make it back to Birdie in one piece and under my own steam. You look up at the walls of this place here, all the memorabilia that's on the walls, how far back it goes, you can't yeah. help but think about all the adventurers that have come through here. Across the desert, down the desert, worked in the desert even. Yeah, that's Trading it. Trading roads and that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, just amazing, isn't it? Well, speaking of adventures, make sure you folks at home get yourself comfortable, grab something cold to drink because in Chapter 3, our adventure continues all the way here to Birdsville. Cheers. Get more for less at Four Wheel Drive Supercenter with insane deals on King's DIY storage and 12 volt gear to build your dream four wheel drive. Whether it's an inverter you need to run 240 volt gear on the job site or the campsite, a battery box or a 12 volt control box to easily access your power, King's 12 volt DIY gear is what you need to take your 12 volt setup to the next level. Need a battery? King's has you covered with a full range of AGM, slimline and lithium batteries in sizes ranging from 98 amp hour to 200 amp hour. All built with ultra high quality components to go the distance. And of course you just can't beat King's solar panels and blankets to silently charge your batteries anytime the sun's out. At Four Wheel Drive Supercenter you get more for less. No doubt about it, in my professional opinion, they're horses. Now, I tell you, that next morning, I've got to say, I wasn't exactly 100% confident the old GU was going to make it. When you are so remote in the middle of the Simpson Desert, you've got a problem like I had, you can't help but think about it constantly. I just packed my swag away and I'm kind of wondering why I even bothered putting it up last night because I reckon I got about an hour's worth of sleep. <laughs> it's crazy, you know. Yesterday, I think, there was a bit of despair and I guess anyone in this situation would understand what I mean when I say a bit of despair. I mean, it's your, it's, your, it's your baby, really, isn't it? You know, you put a lot of love and money and time and effort into these things and then to see it fail when really it shouldn't fail doesn't feel the greatest. But I think I've over that now. That's, that's, that's sort of the past. And now when I look underneath here, it's really important to try and look on the bright side rather than the negative side. And for me, okay, Cracked a chassis shouldn't have happened, but on the bright side, I've got Dave with me who really has the key to Birdsville uh, and in himself is a brilliant welder. He's welded race cars together, roll cages for race cars. They've all to be camp certified. So if that bloke can't weld, well, nobody can. And then in Birdsville, of course, we've got two workshops we can choose from and one of his best mates, Sam, over in Birdsville, is a boilermaker. Does some amazing welding. So if you look at it like that, perhaps I'm actually quite lucky. <laughs> I know that's a warped way of looking at it, but I try and find a silver lining in anything, so we've got a lot of work to do. Well, lads, we've got quite the day ahead of us today. Yep, slow and steady wins the race. I'm just going to try and crawl my way up and over the dunes and try and make it into Birdsville before the sun sets into the ocean. If the sun sets into the ocean out here, we're in trouble. Yeah, we saw a few people struggle over this dune this morning. Yeah, I think we're finding the QAO is pretty chopped up, mostly because of um, people running high tide pressures. Yeah, look, I mean, I just, I went up this and just then, walked up it, didn't even put my foot on the accelerator, just walked up that hill and we saw what, Dave, three people get stuck on that this morning? There you go, it just goes to show you that you can do anything with the correct tire pressures. Nothing else you buy will get you further than tire pressures. The QAA line is just over 100 kilometres long and it was chopped up even more than we thought. This was going to be a painfully slow crawl. I simply couldn't risk putting the chassis under any more pressure. As you can probably see out the window, I am absolutely crawling along and I won't lie to you, it's not a pleasant feeling. Every little bump I hit, 
every noise I hear that's out of the ordinary, if it's a metally type of noise or a squeaky kind of a noise, puts me on edge. Now, as I speak, I'm doing 12 kilometers per hour. Third gear low, I'm about to drop that right down now. I've just downshifted into second now, and the reason I'm doing that, of course, is so that I can read the track, try and pick the smoothest lines. That side of the track right here is quite corrugated. This side's not too bad. And of course, the slower I'm going, the less pressure I'm putting on that chassis. Mechanical sympathy, but on another level. Pretty desperate level, I guess you'd say. After a while, the boys felt it necessary to keep themselves entertained. Yeah, at my expense. Come on, Graham, let's get cracking. That's not funny, Dave. Oh, you crack me up, Graham. <laughs> Boys, you're not helping, you know that. <laughs> we think it's hilarious. <laughs> oh, this is humiliating. Rob and Graham scooted ahead to keep an eye out for traffic and stop and play cards. Graham, do you have a nine? No. Rob, do you have a king? Sparrow. Come on, big girl. Rob, do you have an eight? Uh, Sparrow. Oh, that's just not on. This is humiliating. I refuse to stop. I'm going to leave you in my dust. Oh, I'm, I'm too. leaving you in my dust. <laughs> Cheeky buggers. They'll never catch us, Dave. After hours of crawling at walking speed, just about everything had overtaken me. Traffic to Birdsville, the flies, camels, and even a dust storm had closed in on us. Dave, what on earth is happening here? It's like the end of the world. It seems like a doomsday event, doesn't it? The dust has come in thick and heavy. Oh, I've got to say, I feel a bit privileged. I've not actually witnessed anything like this before. I've seen photos of it, but I've never been in the middle of one. And how long will this last? Is it going to go all night? Am I going to wake up covered in my swag? Oh, I guess there's a chance, but I'd, I would believe that it'll knock off um, you know, once the sun goes down. Although, really, the sun is down because we can't see it. Yeah, right. Well, it happens every September, eh? Yeah, it's pretty typical at this time of year. All I can put it down to is it's the changing of the weather patterns. You know, the, the desert's going out of its winter, which it's really cool weather. And the hot, warmer tropical air is blowing down from the north and it's, it really shifts it around and creates a lot of wind. Tell you what, mate, if ever you want to stop your daytime job, you could be a weatherman. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Hang on a second, mate. I've just lost my flag. It's just broken off in front of me. <laughs> They're talking about strong winds. <laughs> Hang on mate, I'll jump out and give you some cable ties. It's actually a legal requirement out in the Simpson Desert to have a fluorescent sand flag that reaches at least 3.5 metres from the ground. Sand flags are there of course for your own safety. They're designed to help you recognise when another vehicle is approaching from the other side of a sand dune. Whilst that dust storm looked like it had set in, it actually cleared just as quickly as it appeared. We were actually going to get perfect weather for our camp at Air Creek that night. Tell you what, just about done for the day. Scott UHF call from Rob and Graham. They've gone on ahead and they've told us that they've poked on down through the creek here, the yeah, creek, in order to find a campsite they knew about. They've actually camped there before on one of their previous mapping expeditions. Hey Graham, you remember this? Wow mate, that is unbelievable. When we came here before, I would have had water right now, halfway up my windscreen. Yeah, it's, it's incredible how it changes. After seeing it, last time we were here, I didn't think I'd be driving down it. <laughs> this is something else. And have a look at that for a, uh, a sight for sore eyes down there, mate. Fire's going. Tell you what, I wish we could do that all the time. Just rocking the camp, someone's got the fire going for me. Hey, this is a nice campsite. This is a real nice campsite. Of course, with my mind elsewhere, I hadn't really put much thought into that night's camp. But what an absolute doozy of a spot to set up camp it is. I expected that to be our last camp before we reached Birdsville. The iconic Birdsville races were due to start the very next day. We were only 20 odd k's from Big Red now and of course from there into Birdsville it's plain sailing. But I expected that the GU would be in Barnsley's workshop the remainder of that afternoon. Slim 
dusty. Tonight we find ourselves right smack dab in the middle of Air Creek. That's fantastic. But what is there, even right? better is that Rob and Graham came ahead of us today because I was travelling at about good. five kilometres per hour. We got in, what, 45 minutes late? Yeah. 45 minutes late, they had the camp guy going. And they've also put on an absolute tonne of premium lamb chops. Don't know, folks. If you're at home right now and you're thinking, gee whiz, I need to get out bush, you really do. When you get out bush, take the Hema boys with you. Because <laughs> not only can they map, but they can cook. Wow, no wonder it stopped the bullet. That's really quite impressive. Yeah, every shot at the bullet. <laughs> Which was the Barramundi curry. Let's smile for the camera. Ready? Hey! Hey, what are those drums? That's Fred Brophy's boxing tent, and that's a must see. All right, let's do it. Listen, these blokes are going to have a fight on their hands, just as I did when we hit that QAA line, you know. I didn't really expect, and I know Dave had said to me that it was going to be a bit of a struggle, but I didn't realise just how chopped up it was this year. And with the troubles I was having, I really didn't know if I was ever going to make my way to Birdsville. That morning, well, it turned out to be much the same as the day before. Slow crawling up and over some seriously bumpy sand dunes. Driving directly into the sunrise this morning. We were up before dark, swags were packed away just got on the road as the sun's creeping up over the horizon so we're hoping to get in early today and nab ourselves a little bit of workshop space and see if we can't get the big girl fixed before all the hubbub and excitement of the Birdsville races really gets underway because you can imagine there's going to be thousands of people converging on Birdsville coming in this is one of those one of those dunes that oh, you just can feel that chassis but with big red and our goal on the horizon it was time to reflect upon what we'd achieved and how I can't thank the boys from HEMA enough. They'd put in the groundwork and it had paid off. The Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, together with the Central Land Council, had allowed us permits to undertake this expedition. They do a great job at looking after this amazing place so that future generations can all get out here and enjoy it as well. My good mate Ronnie from the Kimberley once told me that if you look after the country, the country will look after you. So with our respect for this great land, we had come out the other side unscathed. Well, good enough anyway. So Graham, according to my HEMA navigator, only two more to go. This little one, and then uh, one big one. Mate, I'll tell you what, I didn't know just how I was going to see Big Red. Well, right. she is big. It doesn't get any smaller, does it? No, that really is a doozy of a sand dune. It's an absolute cracker. I think we made it across, boys. Well, nearly. Woo. One more jam. Don't, don't count your chickens till they've all popped out of the eggs and run around the coop. I've just got to get over it. Well, I think that we will turn to the right where you can see that vehicle coming from. That's the what they call the little red. And um, yeah, I don't think we have a need to go straight up this one with your vehicle in its condition. Mate, I've done it a few times and I don't think I'll be doing it with a crack chassis. That's for sure. Take me to little red. Uh, have a look at that, will you? Big red, such an icon out here and I'm driving past it. Been up it a couple of times in my life. But I was really looking forward to giving it a thrash in the big GU because of course it would have been the first time for me. So essentially it is like getting to Big Red for the very first time. So put yourself in my shoes. Imagine you've never been out to the Simpson Devon, you've never seen Big Red. And you've just got to drive past it. It's killing me. Have a look how many people there are out there. Thousands of them, all having a ball. Oh, I can't look anymore, it's killing me. With our eyes on the prize, we still had to make it up and over Little Red. But even that can be notoriously soft and cut up. Well, Graham, I think the way you've been crossing those dunes, you're going to find a little red. Pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't ever count me chickens. <laughs> so I'm just going to crawl up like I've been doing, mate. And trust in tyre pressures. Trust in the big G, you. Yep, there's a steep one. I'll wait for the one for your call, mate. One last one for the mighty 200, Ooh. mate. No problems whatsoever. Woo! Yeah, straight on on the other side.
Yes, yes. You shall make it to Birdsville. Yeah, I think I will now, mate. I think I can say I will now. You know, it's trips like this that really do solidify friendships, and it means I'm going to keep in touch with these blokes for the rest of my life. We'd made it, the top of Little Red. From here, it was all plain sailing into Birdsville. I tell you what, two days earlier, I didn't think I'd be doing this like this. I thought I'd be arriving in town on the back of Barnsley's tow rig. Lovely work, boys, lovely work. Boys, thank you so much. Thank Graham, you so much. Thank you, Graham. Dave. Graham. Rob, Graham. Graham. Thanks so much, mate. Well, we should have you when I finish Oh, no, we are, don't we? <laughs> so you boys are pushing on? Yeah, we've got a map to make. We'll get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, well, I'm going to bid you farewell. Thank you so much for hanging around. It really means a lot, getting us in here safely. It's we'll just downhill from here, mate. It is. I'm going to roll into Birdsville. All right, I'm going to let you blokes go. Enjoy your trip. Be safe. I'll give you an email when I get back to Perth. All right. All right, shall we all get out of here? Yeah. All right, let's go. All that was left now was a 20 kilometre drive along a graded dirt road, and we'd made it to Birdsville. Luckily, Barnsley at the Birdsville Roadhouse actually had a spare slot in his hoist, and Sam, one of the best welders I've ever seen, and one of his mechanics, went to work. Whilst the crack was nothing major, Sam had a quick look at it and knew that he could fix it up better than brand new. Of course, once home, I was going to have to look at bracing that section of the chassis, but for now, I was going to get home, no dramas at all. Well, I am absolutely stoked. I'm back in the game. Sam and Barnes are here at the Birdsville Roadhouse. Managed to weld up that crack in the chassis, and they have done a stellar job. You ought to see that weld. Sam is an artist with a welder. But what's even better than that is, They've done it in such a time frame that I've got all day to enjoy what is turning out to be an absolutely cracking day one of the Birdsville races. You think I'm over the moon? You don't know the half of it. <laughs> no, I'm trying not to. Not now, anyway. Busy here. Two of your curried camels, please. Well, these are sure better. These whips are nice. You got a whip? The Birdsville races turned out to be everything I was told about and more. People go to extraordinary lengths not only to get out here, but once they're here, they dress up and have a blast of a time. So what are you thinking? Uh, I don't know. Just because it sounds a bit casual, maybe Joe Blow. Joe Blow? Done. Alright, then we're going here to get a better. Yeah, we're we'll going to find a boogie. Faster Buster, mate, number 11. That one there says it all. I've got this. The festivities out at the racetrack, you've got to see them to believe them. This place is going off. Come on, come on! Where is he? I think I've come last. That was all a bit confusing. Yeah. There's everything you need out here from food to bars to souvenirs and of course to the iconic races themselves is hard to believe in the middle of the desert. That was my first time at the Birdsville races and I guarantee it will not be my last. Be here before the next round? I think so. That's cool, cool, cool. Well, what an epic day. And it's a fitting end to an epic trip. The Simpson Desert, you know, I knew when we left the Geo Centre that we're going to be up against it getting back onto the hay and back down into Birdsville. But the complications that arose really meant that it was one heck of a slug. And although David said the QIA line was as cut up as you'd ever seen it, I guess I underestimated it just a little. And you never underestimate somewhere like the Simpson Desert. One amazing trip, one I won't forget in a while, yourself? Oh, uh, not at all. Not That's at all. the way. That's the way. Look, folks, might see you out here next time because I hope to get back to the Simo very, very soon. I might not, but I'll definitely see you again on four wheel drive action. It's uh, your shout. My shout. Let's go. Let's go, mate. Forget building your own set of storage drawers or paying well over $1,000 for a set elsewhere. And get your hands on a set of incredibly tough and unbeatable value for money, Titan Storage Drawers. Our entire range of Titan Storage Drawers have been built to handle just about anything you can throw at them. All models of Titan Double Drawers come with an included built-in fridge slide on the left-hand side, saving you up to $200 compared to some other brands that charge extra for a fridge slide. Each draw top also has these heavy duty spring loaded tie down points to secure your gear on even the most corrugated roads. We've put them through their paces like none other. We've jumped on them, overloaded them with bricks, chucked an engine on the drawers at full extension, absolutely flooded them and used them off road year after year to prove just how tough they are. The Titan 900 single drawer is perfect for those who have limited space to install a storage drawer. It has internal dimensions of 430 millimeters wide, 790 millimeters long and 190 millimeters deep. 
The Titan 900 double jaw setup is ideal for smaller wagons like Prados, Pajeros and SUVs, with the internal dimensions identical to the 900 single draw on each side. The Titan 1300 ute drawers are made specifically for vans and utes. The internal dimensions are 1200mm long, 430mm wide and 150mm high. The 1300mm single drawers are also a cracking addition to the back of vans and utes. The internal dimensions are the same as the double 1300 drawers, but have an extra 40mm of depth, making them 190mm deep. And finally, for the bigger wagons like Land Cruisers and Patrols, the double 1070 storage drawers have internal dimensions of 880mm long, 470mm wide and 180mm of depth. They come 95% pre-assembled and all you need to install them is a couple of basic hand tools and a couple of hours on a lazy Sunday Arvo. You can also add optional wing kits, both model specific and DIY. So you can finish off the back of your four wheel drive and have plenty of storage available for your next adventure. Take your setup to the next level with the incredibly tough and unbeatable value for money Titan Storage Drawers. If you're after a next level 12 volt upgrade for your vehicle or your next camping trip, then check this out. The Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium battery. This uses high capacity, brand new grade A lithium iron phosphate cells capable of thousands of cycles. It's paired with a high quality BMS able to output up to 160 amps of current. The future of 12 volt setups is here. Lithium batteries are super lightweight and still have heaps of power capacity. In fact, this battery weighs just over 15 kilos. That's about half as much as a similar capacity AGM. But that's not all. Lithium batteries have the ability to use their entire capacity from 100 to 0% and still have an incredibly long life. The reason Adventure King's lithium batteries are so good is because they use lithium iron phosphate chemistry. That means if you're using the entire 120 amp hours of capacity in this battery every day, it would still last almost five and a half years. Some cheap lithium batteries use grade B or even secondhand cells to keep the cost down, but not here. Adventure King's lithium iron phosphate batteries use brand new grade A prismatic cells. When these batteries are assembled, each individual cell is matched with others and then grouped. Then those cells are balanced, which means that these batteries always function at their best and ensure you have full capacity. Another major feature of these Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium batteries is the high quality internal battery management system. This BMS for short takes care of the individual cells. It balances them while you're charging your battery. It prevents overcharge, over discharge, over temperature and short circuits. A high quality BMS is so important and it's also incredibly important to match the BMS to the cells and the use of the battery. A good indicator of a high quality BMS is to look for high current discharge and charge ratings. This battery is capable of charging and discharging constantly at up to 100 amps and it can do a peak discharge of 160 amps of current. A high discharge current and a high peak discharge current are very important if you want to run things like inverters that need a lot of power when they turn on to fill the capacitors. If you're looking at a battery that has a much lower charge and discharge rate, they could be cost cutting by using a cheaper BMS. Lithium iron phosphate is a safe technology, unlike some other lithium chemistries, and Adventure King's lithium batteries are doubly safe. Not only are they sealed and safe to use in your vehicle, they've also passed a short circuit test, overcharge test, over temperature test, and a vibration test. So they're ready to be put to use. Some lithium batteries are extremely sensitive to hot and cold temperatures, and they can be damaged or destroyed by trying to use them. Adventure King's batteries though, can be charged anywhere from zero to 50 degrees Celsius, and used or discharged anywhere from negative 20 right through to plus 60 degrees Celsius. They use threaded M8 terminals for high power output and easy connection. Measuring it at 330 millimeters long by 162 millimeters wide and 215 millimeters tall, they fit perfectly in an Adventure King's battery box for a lightweight and powerful portable power station. And with 120 amp hours on tap, you could run a camping fridge for five or even six days. 
or you can permanently install them in your vehicle for a next level, super powerful setup that barely weighs anything. And for that reason, they're perfect for your full drive, motorhome, caravan, or camper trailer, where you need to be concerned about GVM and GCM limits. So if you want a safe, lightweight, super powerful, and super long lasting lithium battery for your next level setup, you can't beat an Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium battery. Introducing the incredible Adventure King's Premium Camp Oven Stove. Your new best mate for delicious barbecue or campfire cooking and warm, cozy fires whether you're at home in your backyard or at your favorite campsite. Let me show you all the things that I absolutely love about it and I'm sure you're gonna love too. This amazing bit of gear has been designed right here in Australia and it combines a camping stove and a portable barbecue into one. It can run off multiple fuel sources, wood, heat beads, charcoal, briquettes, and more. When it's time to cook up a feast, you can fit two large pots or pans on this huge flat cooktop surface that measures in at 520 millimeters long by 300 millimeters wide. That's enough space to cook up a feast for the entire family. And because it runs on wood or heat beads, you can leave the gas bottle behind. One less thing to pack. And when you want a beautiful roaring campfire, use the included hook tool to simply lift the two piece lid off completely and just add in some more firewood. The raised and closed design means you won't risk scorching your grass, your deck, or even your driveway. And you'll be able to use it for a beautiful warm fire at campsites that don't allow open ground fires. Plus your fire would last longer because you're closer to the heat. Now that's cozy. The enclosed design means it's super efficient and you can make the most of your fuel by directing the heat exactly where you want it. You can even adjust the temperature of your fire by varying the airflow. With these sliding vents on the side, a two-piece removable lid on top and an adjustable flue, you're always in control. Remove the entire lid for an open fire or just this circular inner piece if you need extra heat for cooking, like searing steaks to finish them off. And this up here, now that is a real game changer. A chimney that extends over 2.4 meters off the ground to direct smoke away from your campsite for smoke-free campfires. You can even position the premium camp oven stove under your awning, your gazebo, or your shed for maximum warmth. And the angular offset chimney piece allows smoke to funnel away rather than getting trapped underneath. There's even a spark arrestor on top for good measure. There are so many more things to absolutely love about the King's Premium Camp Oven Stove. It's been designed to be super sturdy with these four large legs that extend the footprint a foot wider in both directions for excellent stability. The legs simply screw into the bottom like this and you can remove the middle piece for a lower fire. This huge access door swings open with the included hook tool to allow you to easily refill the Premium Camp Oven Stove as required. Inside, you've got this fuel rack that keeps your wood or your charcoal up off the floor, maximizing airflow and preventing wasted heat. It's a breeze to transport, set up and pack down too, with no tools required. Each of the four two-piece legs simply screw together and the chimney pieces pack into each other, with everything fitting into the main body of the premium camp oven stove for simple transport. Make sure you don't miss the incredible genuine cooking accessories available too, like a proper wood-fired meat smoker and a clever barbecue hot plate set to really take your camp cooking to the next level. And a stainless steel water boiler too. Whether I'm at home in my backyard or out camping with family, my mates, or even by myself, I absolutely love my Adventure King's premium camp oven stove. It's a portable fire pit, it's a wood or charcoal barbecue, and it's the centerpiece of every backyard get together or camping adventure, and I know you're gonna love yours too. Introducing the insane new Adventure King's nine inch lethal LED driving lights. These things have an amazing combination of both spot and flood light. They have 21,840 lab proven effective lumens per pair. That's over 2,000 more than the previous generation. Plus they have huge light distance performance with one lux at over 1.3 kilometers. These are the LED driving lights that other lights wish they were. You asked and we listened. You said you wanted even more flood of light out of your LED driving lights to light up the sides of the road, the highway, and the tracks. 
we went back to the drawing board to redesign the lethal LED driving lights to produce exactly that. At the same time, we upgraded the lights to the ridiculously tough King's laser light die-cast aluminium housings and 3mm folded steel mounts. So not only are these some of the brightest LED driving lights we've ever sold, but they're also the toughest. How bright? Try a lab-proven 21,840 lumens per pair and one lux of 1,342 meters. That's real-world lumens too, not the theoretical lumens that some lights claim they produce. That's thanks to the genuine German-designed Osram LEDs for simply unparalleled light performance. We've also re-engineered the lethal lights with a new 5,185 Kelvin color temperature. That means they're just a little bit more on the softer, warmer side. Still a clear, crisp white light, but that little bit easier on the eyes when driving long distances. And of course, you get all the features and quality you'd expect from Adventure King's driving lights, like polycarbonate lenses, the same stuff riot shields and fighter jet canopies are made of, and an IP68 water and dustproof rating, meaning these lights are waterproof to a depth of a meter for an hour. Plus, for the first time ever, they're rated to IP69K. That means they can withstand high pressure jets of hot water. That tough die cast alloy housing features passive cooling fins and a waterproof breather for longevity. And they have the ability to run on both 12 and 24 volt, meaning they're suitable for everything from cars and four wheel drives to trucks and machinery. Including the brackets, they measure 250 millimeters high, 230 millimeters wide, and 115 millimeters deep. They have an attachment system that uses two 8mm bolts on either side to positively lock them in place and prevent them from falling out of alignment. And of course, they use the same plug as all previous Adventure King's lights, which makes them an easy 10 minute upgrade. Just unplug your old lights, bolt the new ones on, plug them in and you're ready to go. Add in a two year warranty and you've got a simply incredible set of lights that leave the competition looking a little underwhelming. The Adventure King's 9-inch lethal LED driving lights are the best value LED driving lights on the market. We've re-engineered them to be incredibly tough and incredibly bright. They'll turn night into day, and they're on sale right now for a price you have to see to believe. You asked and we've listened. The incredible MT1 Go Anywhere camper trailer has just received an ATM upgrade to two tonnes. All new Adventure Kings MT1 camper trails will now come with the new upgraded two tonne ATM. But don't worry if you already own an MT1 because a retrofit upgrade kit is available too. The MT1 is already an ultra tough trailer with a one piece 150 by 50 mil chassis that extends right from the drawbar all the way to the back of the trailer. Now it's even tougher with upgraded suspension, bearings, brakes and wheels to bring it up to a two ton ATM. The brakes are upgraded from 10 inch to 12 inch electric brakes. The alloy rims are now rated to two ton ATM and an upgraded set of suspension arms also suit the upgraded ATM. And for existing owners, the retrofit upgrade is incredibly easy to do at home yourself. Everything just bolts onto the trailer with no modifications needed. That extra payload capacity means that you've got more ability than ever before to carry the gear that you need and still remain legal. For more information and full detailed specs on the MT1, see the Four Wheel Drive Supercenter website. Now with a two ton ATM upgrade, the Adventure King's MT1 Go Anywhere camper trailer can carry more gear than ever before.